So um, I'm just going to talk briefly about prevention of eczema, so primary prevention. And so um, when we're thinking about how we can we prevent the disease, it's useful to think about what the cause of the disease is, obviously. And so as you see on this picture, we're thinking about um, disrupted skin barrier, allergen and irritant influx, and the inflammatory responses that we see in the body. And so when we think about prevention, the sort of the main groups that have been looked at in terms of research so far have been about skin barrier support, avoidance of allergens, avoidance of irritants, um, dietary allergen avoidance and support of the intestinal microbiome. I might not have as much information on that as you would like, I'm sorry. And so probably the most exciting thing in terms of ex-prevention has been um, some recent results looking at um, emollient therapy to prevent eczema. And so the, the idea between this is that you, is that you use your emollient like a, a protective layer on top of your skin. I call it the paint on the wall. House maintenance, very important. And that helps stop the allergen irritant influx, reduce that inflammatory response and supports that natural skin barrier function. And so there are a few studies and I think there's going to be a lot more coming out looking at use of emollients to prevent eczema. So these two uh, papers were published in the Journal of Allergy and Cl Clinical Immunology and they both looked at use of emollient preemptively from the first weeks of life in babies at high risk of developing eczema. So these are infants whose parents have a history of allergy A to B or have siblings with that. And the first study was an um, international study between uh, the UK and the States. And they, had a, um, they describe it more as a pilot. They're planning to do a larger study. And they gave the parents the option of a few different topical agents, either a, a refined sunflower seed oil. Um, you can't use normal cooking sunflower seed oil. That's been modified to be more like olive oil, which is known to irritate the skin. So don't go home and put sunflower seed on. Um, a double base, which is a moisturiser available in the UK. It's a little bit like uh, fatty cream. A Cetaphil, which is a brand that you can buy and is available in the States, that's what they used in the States. Or 50-50 um, liquid white soft paraffin, which is known as duolium in New Zealand. That's available here, but it's not funded yet. Hopefully will be. Um, and they, about, about uh, two-thirds of the families ended up using one of these two moisturising cream agents because they were the most considered, found to be the most acceptable. About 20 to 25% used the the oil and about 10 to 15, about 10 percent use the, the thicker ointment. So people don't like the ointments as much. Um, so generally 85 percent reported using it five to seven days a week so they were pretty good at using the creams on a daily basis and at six months the rates of eczema and in the intervention group compared to control were 50 percent lower. So it had quite a good relative risk but relatively small numbers. But that's quite exciting, I think. The second study was from Japan, so a different patient population, similar kind of numbers of babies. And they, had, they used petrolata, which is basically a paraffin-based mineral ointment, mineral. Um, and they found that at eight months of age, there was a 32% reduction in incident eczema in those. So this, I think, is looking really exciting. Um, and hopefully it's going to be something that we can continue to use. Obviously, there's been a bit of concern about what emollients we use because, as you know, there's an issue with aqueous cream a while ago with that being a potential irritant on some patients. And so I think we have to be a little bit careful before we start rolling out things more widely. But I think this is probably going to be where it's at for eczema. Sorry, just a quick question. So, in someone who had their first child had very severe eczema and then they're having a subsequent trial, would you be recommending that they use daily and what would you recommend they use? It's usually in the, you know, those really mm. little leads, I'd say, don't put anything on. So yeah, um, I probably would use one of the funded emollients because like it's fatty. like fatty cream or sorbeline. Yeah. Um, I, there are some people who don't like those and they want to use a natural oil. Mm. Um, and I have to say that. 
uh, there's been studies that show that olive oil is irritating to the skin barrier. And they think, they think that's from the oleic acid levels in it, and that's why they've been looking at sunflower seed oil, because it's got low levels of oleic acid. Coconut oil's got low level of oleic acid, but they haven't studied that because they're Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, if I can just jump in there, mm. I wouldn't be using any food-based oil on the skin for exactly that reason about mm. sensitisation. So yeah. So probably so the mineral yeah fatty cream one of the funded ones. I, I tend to prefer people. I mean, if they want to use Cetaphil, that's fine, but it gets really expensive, and I don't know many families who've got lots of money for that with small babies. Um, interestingly, I think soap is probably a big player in incidence of eczema, but there's no research on that. Lots of consensus opinions. Um, Why don't we continue to tell people not to use soap? Because it becomes very apparent when you use it, you get worse. <laughs> so when you stop it going, and so but nobody's actually done a prospective trial of that. But yeah, no, it's needed. I absolutely agree with you. Um, and so that's all consensus opinion that you should avoid those products. It's known if you leave them on the skin, they are irritating. Sodium lauryl sulfate. And so this was in um, aqueous cream until recently. And so quite a few people actually developed irritation from aqueous cream. It's still an emulsifying ointment, but in lower levels. But I've had a few people, I've stopped their emulsifying ointment and it's, their skin's got quite a bit better. So I think there is potential for anyone to react to any product they're putting on their skin. And I think if, you've got, if they've been using the same emollient for years and years and years and they've still got bad eczema, then it, a change is not a bad idea. Um, <laughs> Um, in terms of diet, this is probably where there's been a lot of research, often funded by companies that make formulas. Um, basically, um, there has not been any evidence that avoiding foods during pregnancy and lactation helps with preventing eczema, so we would encourage mothers to eat a broad, healthy diet. Um, there is in terms of breastfeeding, I think um, the studies are out, uh, pretty much breastfeeding probably isn't protective against eczema, it's certainly not protective against eczema when you're six or seven years of age and quite a few studies have shown that. There's possibly some benefit for infantile eczema in a high risk group, but I don't think eczema prevention is the reason to breastfeed. But there's lots of other good reasons to breastfeed. So I'm not saying don't breastfeed, but um, that's not what it's going to do. Um, there is one study looking at early weaning at four to five months of age that showed possibly that was protective. So that may get looked at a bit more because we want to make sure if we are going to change our advice around age of introduction of solids that we're not causing problems, but that suggests it's protective. And that's similar to the findings of the Christchurch Child Development Study that was back in the 70s and 80s, and they found a similar benefit from early weaning in terms of preventing eczema there. So that's pos probably, tr possibly true. Hydrolyzed, partially or extensively hydrolyzed formula in terms of prevention of eczema doesn't seem to be helpful. So breastfeeding if you can, if you can't breastfeed, then you can have a normal infant formula. Um, house dust mite avoidance, no evidence that that helps. Exposure to pets, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of research in that as part of the hygiene hypothesis. I think as a, people were going off on a tangent with that. I wouldn't buy a dog to prevent eczema. <laughs> um, <coughs> probiotics, as Jan said, this is a, a difficult field to assess all the studies in because there are such variations in the type of probiotic, how it's administered, and um, how it has to be, how active it is when people actually give it to themselves or their child. Um, there's some evidence that these may be protective against eczema in both a general population and a high risk population. If you are going to take probiotics, you need to take them prenatally as well as postnatally, because postnatal alone doesn't work in some of the studies. Um, and most of them have looked at a variety of lactobacilli 
and they're so various, variable, it's hard to say. Essentially, um, if people want to take a probiotic, I don't think that's unreasonable. I don't think the evidence is strong enough for us to put it in our guidelines and they are, are a cost for a family, so they may be better buying a better car seat. Um, um, so, no benefit, avoiding foods, hydrolyzed formula, avoiding dust mite, uncertain, exclusive breastfeeding, um, avoidance of soap, but probably some benefit from probiotics pet ownership. And I think what we're going to see in the next few years is this regular emollient use in early life, and I'm hoping that will be helpful in cutting our rates in New Zealand. So, uh, thank you, Dana, that kind of sets the scene. So, I'm going to talk a bit about primary and secondary prevention. But just to redefine it, primary prevention, we're really thinking in terms of food allergy about preventing sensitisation, so stopping you from getting a positive test in the first place. In food allergy, secondary sen prevention is really, can if you are sensitised, can we prevent you from manifesting food allergy? So if you've got a positive test, can we stop you from actually being clinically allergic? And then tertiary prevention is really, if you are food allergic, what can we do to stop you having food allergic reactions? And that'll come into the sort of um, management uh, bit after lunch. So, um, there are some unmodifiable factors about your chance of getting allergic. There are some general modifiable factors, some stuff about food tolerance specifically, and then I wanted to introduce the um, new ASCII guidelines which have been put up on the website in the last maybe six weeks or so um, for uh, food allergy prevention advice. We've already spoken a little bit about what some of those unmodifiable factors are. So genetics plays a role. If you've got a child in a family with peanut allergies, there's about a 7% chance of other siblings being peanut allergic. If you're an identical twin, you've got about a 70% concordance for peanut allergy. Um, but just uh, to remind me to make the point that um, you don't inherit a tendency to a specific food, you inherit a tendency to food allergy. So milk, egg, peanut make up three quarters of what we see but you don't inherit a tendency to peanut, it's just that peanut's really common. We've got one set of identical twins where one's milk allergic and the other's wheat allergic, which is extremely annoying for the family. <laughs> um, and we've also got some identical triplets who between them are allergic to milk, egg, fish and shellfish, but actually I don't know who's allergic to what, and I'm not actually sure the mother does because it's quite hard to tell who's who most of the time. <laughs> Um, ethnicity, it's unclear whether in isolation ethnicity is a factor. You do see different patterns of food allergy in different ethnicity. And partly that'll be due to what's eaten in that community. You know, you get a lot more chickpea allergy in India, you get more um, fish allergy in Scandinavia. Almost all of the kids I've ever seen with coconut allergy, which is not very many, but they're mostly Pacific children. But it comes down to this interplay then between gene and the environment, and that's on the next slide. And then most studies show a preponderance of male over female in terms of risks of food or chances of food allergy. The thing about interplay of genes and the environment, this is some stuff out of the Health Nut study. So the Health Nut study is this massive Melbourne study where they recru recruited a whole lot of kids in a vaccination clinic in the community. So broad cross-section, not selected for anything. They skin tested them all, they food challenged anyone who had a positive test or anyone who thought they were allergic to anything. And so they've got incredibly robust data about food allergy in this population. And what this graph is showing you is so that this is rates of any food allergy, egg allergy and peanut <coughs> allergy if both your parents are born in Australia. Now Health Nuts showed a rate of egg allergy of just about 8%, so this is challenge proven egg allergy. So really, really high in the general population. <coughs> if one of your parents was born in UK or Europe, it was slightly higher. If both your parents were born in UK and Europe, it was slightly higher again. But this is the data for if one of your parents was born in East Asia. And this is if both your parents are born in East Asia and you're born in Australia. And so that's challenge proven egg allergy of just under 25%, which is extraordinary. You know, no one's ever seen that sort of rate. So it's this, you know, these 
these families don't have a history of food allergy, they don't have a massive history of ATOP, but there's something about being born in the Australian environment that's different. And we don't have data for New Zealand, which I'm a bit embarrassed about, but there you are. Um, we should look at it, but we can do a whole clinic and have every single patient being New Zealand born Chinese or Indian babies with parents who were born overseas. So I'm sure that it's similar. Um, Diana's already shown you one version of this. So this is this dual allergen hypothesis um, proposed by Gideon Lack and George Dutoir from the UK. And it's really, you know, we've known for a long time, in an animal model, if you want to study food allergy and you want to make an animal allergic to a food, you don't feed it to them, you rough up the skin and you put the food on the skin. And that's the best way to sensitise. And essentially that is what we do to babies with eczema. So there's a couple of studies, Adam Fox looked at this in the UK and they looked at the highest chance of getting food allergy and it was kids who had eczema who lived in a house where the consumption of peanut was really high and so there, that there would be peanut in the environment and then another group went on and vacuumed dust out of beds and sofas and carpets and showed that there was a direct correlation between your chances of being sensitised if you didn't eat peanut but you had eczema and there was a high environmental load and um, you know my son's now 15, but and so he had eczema as a baby, and I followed all of the guidelines at the time of not giving him peanut butter, but um, ate a lot of it myself, and undoubtedly kissed his eczema -y cheeks with peanut on multiple occasions until finally he became peanut allergic, which I, you know is probably preventable in the current model. But anyway, um, so exposure via the skin is creates an allergic type response, whereas the gut is predominantly tolerising. <coughs> Diana's already touched on this with relation to eczema, but the information's essentially the same in terms of prevention of food allergy. So there's no evidence to support allergen avoidance during pregnancy or breastfeeding to prevent food allergy. In terms of treatment, I'm probably not going to come back to that this afternoon, but we would very seldom be suggesting maternal exclusion diets for treatment of IgE food allergy. Occasionally, you will see kids who do react to the very small amounts that are in breast milk, and in that situation you would, but the majority we would not need to do that. It's no doubt food gets into breast milk, and in the long run, if we're thinking that oral exposure is good for you, then we shouldn't be cutting it out because maybe that will be generally tolerising. So, sorry, is that advice? So, in general, what the mum eats, very small amounts of that gets into breast milk. Yeah. And, and if you look at it, I mean, and again, a lot of the stuff gets done with peanut because it's a common allergen, but if you feed women 50 grams of peanut, then for about half of them you can measure peanut in the breast milk in about four hours. Now whether that's the same women all the time, I don't know, or whether you're more or less likely to get measurable allergen in your breast milk, I don't know. I don't think that's been done. But it's that sort of time frame, it gets in pretty quickly. Because, so, like, I've got mums come back to me saying, oh, I've seen so and so for the baby's reflux, and I'm not eating avocados and bananas and blah, 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 because yes. just, that's just a load of, right? Well, um, Look, so I, in my whole, I've probably seen two or three kids who I think have clearly had an IgE allergic reaction via breast milk, but I mean, actually most of it's been fish, which has made sense to me in the sense that you eat fish in a large quantity as a single thing, and have had a couple of babies where the mothers come and say, I'm sure they're fish allergic because I ate fish for dinner and breastfed six hours later and the baby got covered in urticaria. Mm -hmm. And I think, clear. you know, I think, whereas, you know, it's much more difficult to be sure of that association between milk and egg. And occasionally, you know, particularly if the baby's had a food allergic reaction to something and they've got dreadful skin, then you might try maternal avoidance for a little while to see if it makes a difference. But if it doesn't, I wouldn't carry it on. And I wouldn't avoid every skerrick, you know, because if you eat this much, this much gets into breast milk. So if you have a cake that's got this much in it, I suspect that's not going to cause trouble no matter what. You know. A lot of the time you get asked how long it stays in the mum, like you know, if they start doing a dairy food free or something like that, do you know, are there studies that have been done that shows how long? Well the, the graph I can think of is peanut where it peaked at about four to six hours and then it dropped off. And that was a significant load of peanut? Yeah, just like so that was a bolus large amount, one go. Yeah. 
So it's not going to stay in there for weeks. And so if you don't see any benefit in two days, it's probably enough. Um, specifically, food allergy related, there's no benefit proven for breastfeeding in terms of preventing food allergy. There is a kind of a concept that, you know, all of the other sort of immune modulatory stuff about breast milk may be tolerising, but there's nothing to prove that either. Um, and Dinah's already mentioned that in terms of infant formula, to prevent food allergy, there's no evidence for use of modified infant formula. So there was a previous recommendation about using a partially hydrolyzed formula. So, you know, you've got standard formulas, partially hydrolyzed formulas where the proteins are a little bit broken down, extensively hydrolyzed formulas, which are prescription, very broken down, and then amino acid formulas. And there was a thought that maybe partially hydrolyzed had a role in prevention, but subsequently it's been reviewed in the Cochrane now saying, no, it doesn't. So it wouldn't do anything, just normal for. Um, we were talking a little bit about vitamin D uh, before the break, and so this is also out of the Health Nut study, which has generated an enormous amount of information which continues to come out. But this is just looking at um, vitamin D. So the clear bars are vitamin D insufficiency, so vitamin D of under 50, and the dark bars are vitamin D deficiency, so under 25. This is no food allergy where, you know, in a normal population, so that's still maybe 12% of the population who've got a lowish level of vitamin D. One food allergy, 25% uh, have got a low vitamin D. Two or more food allergies, almost half of them have got a low vitamin D. So there seems to be a pretty clear dose effect of that. And then this is looking at, this is no eczema or food allergy. Eczema alone food allergy alone, eczema and food allergy. So in fact, vitamin D doesn't seem to have a role in terms of eczema, but it does seem to have a role in terms of food allergy. So food allergy alone, over 30% with vitamin D insufficiency, eczema and food allergy, 30% with vitamin D insufficiency. And the other thing that the Health Nut study looked at was it wasn't just vitamin D deficiency, but actually persistence of food allergies was more common in the kids in whom vitamin D deficiency was not corrected. So it's not just that it's a risk for getting food allergy. If we don't think about it, then it's a risk for not growing out of food allergy. Jane, can I ask you, do you test vitamin D levels in your food? That's the next slide. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna answer any questions. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it'll be there later. Um, this is one of those, you know, you've got to have a talk like this if you do immunology. Why would vitamin D be important? Vitamin D has enormous numbers of effects. It definitely has blocking effects on sort of allergic type responses and promotes T regulatory function. But there's also a question about vitamin D, whether it actually has a, a, an effect on the gut microbiota directly as opposed to being via its immunologic mechanisms. Um, and this is the Starship guideline about vitamin D deficiency prevention, and so that's on starship.org.nz. Management of children at risk of vitamin D deficiency, and so there's a little list on the website about who you might think of as at risk, so more pigmented skin, season of birth, covered up, so um, Muslim kids who haven't got much skin, uh, skin exposed to the sun. The guidelines suggest that if you're at risk of vitamin D deficiency, then but you don't have any signs or symptoms, then you shouldn't have testing. And the, certainly the Auckland Hospital Labs, and I don't know if this is the same around the country, they're very keen that we don't do a lot of vitamin D testing because it's an expensive test. Um, and what they suggest is uh, treatment on an annual basis. So treatment under the age of 12 months with vitamin C um, and advised breastfeeding mothers to be checked with their GP. Age one to two, high dose treatment in, in autumn and with different doses for one to two, two to five and over five. And we do try and remember to do this routinely at clinic uh, in terms of the patients potentially at risk, which is a big chunk. One of the issues for, that some of you will realise is that the current preparation on the New Zealand market has got a warning on it about, um, it's got soy oil as an, as an ingredient and under a European standard, if you've got soy oil as an ingredient and a pharmaceutical agent, you have to put a warning on it to say it's not appropriate if you've got peanut allergy. Now, that's completely illogical to me and 
most of the kids we see who've got peanut allergy are not soy allergic and there's absolutely no reason why they shouldn't use this product. Um, and even actually the patients who are soy allergic can probably use it. But. So um, you're saying in your clinic you're seeing kids obviously with the diagnosis. So treating their vitamin, D, what does treating the vitamin D deficiency do in terms of like their food allergy? Does it improve food allergy or just stop them getting out of food allergy? Well, we don't know the answer to that. Certainly Katie's stuff from Melbourne said that if you didn't treat it, then it was associated with persistence. So because they were looking, you know, they collected all these samples and then looked back at it. Now some of those kids will have been treated and had their vitamin D normalised, and those kids had a higher rate of resolution than the kids who didn't. So it might actually make the allergy go away faster. Yeah, that's right.